you have your Bibles, you can open up to Matthew chapter 5. Many of you will know this. Many of you will know this verse. Often referred to uh, as the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 and verse 5. Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. There's a few popular sayings in the world. Might makes right. Only the strong survive. Senator William Mace Marcy said in 1832 that to the victor goes the spoils. Jesus, contrary to the spirit of the world, referenced the psalmist David who had a thousand years before Jesus even came to this earth and these words in Psalm 37. For evildoers shall be cut off. Verse 9. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it, it shall not be. Verse 11, David says, But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. I felt this for the last few weeks, and I want us to pray that God will just help take this burden that He has placed on me and, and, and be able to effectively hear it, communicate it, preach it, teach it, whatever it is that the Holy Ghost would desire. I want to talk about the subject of meekness. And if you would so desire a title for your remembrance, I would entitle this message, Powerfully Meek. Powerfully Meek. Amen. Can we pray together, church? Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. We magnify your name. We glorify you. Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let your will be done. Not just in situations, not just, God, in those things that maybe we desire to see happen not just in job situations financial situations family situations but Lord in me let your will be done in me God whatever it is that you are deciding in heaven to be done in my life God I, I want it to come to pass in Jesus name Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Amen. Also tonight, remember, um, we will be taking up a, a, uh, an offering, uh, Christmas for Christ. Uh, we talked about that a couple, um, a couple weeks ago, but we will take up an offering during the Christmas program tonight. Uh, everything that is collected tonight in the offering will go towards um, North American Missions. Um, and also, you'll notice in the vestibule that uh, Sister Shelley made some peanut brittle and some homemade suckers, and she wants uh, all the proceeds of that to go to uh, Christmas for Christ, so you can wait until the service is done. But uh, I did check it out. Looks looks delightful, so thank you so much for that. For very early in your Bible, you are going to meet uh, a person by the name of Joseph. Joseph is called a dreamer. Anybody know dreamers? Anybody know those people that just 
You know what? They're, 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 how do I say it nicely? Their, their head is always in the clouds. They're, they're always looking for that next big thing. And, 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 and they're just, they're not quite so much focused on the here is now as much as they are really just, hey, I have an idea. Or, you know, one day, here's what I'm going to do. And, and, and that's how Joseph was. Joseph was a dreamer. And not only was Joseph a dreamer, but he was also the youngest of a big family, and he was kind of the golden child, right? He, he got the coat from dad. He was, he was daddy's special boy, and, uh, and the brothers certainly recognized that. So you can imagine how his 10 older brothers felt when Joseph shared his dreams. He's like, hey, hey guys, I, I had a dream. Oh, really, dreamer? Why don't you tell us about it? Well, here's what happened in the dream. Um, you all were bowing down to me. <laughs> I was ruling over you. Isn't that an awesome dream? And you can just imagine how that would, how that would kind of grind on them. He, he shared this dream of the, the big plans that God had for him. In Genesis 37 and verse 12, his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And, and daddy said to Joseph, hey, aren't your brothers feeding the flock in, in Shechem? He said, come, I'm going to send you to them. So Joseph said, here I am, dad. I'll, I'll do whatever it is that you want. And then just even check the the. the the verbiage of what dad is saying to him. He said, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. Doesn't that kind of sound like a, uh, maybe an overseer or a supervisor type role? Like, go check on your brothers. <laughs> Anybody ever do that with your younger ones? Hey, go see what your brothers are up to. Go, go check on them and report back to me and it's probably not wise parenting, but we do it a lot. <laughs> it's probably, probably not a good way to, to help the, the, the sibling relationship, but that's kind of what, what, what father had said to Joseph. Go check on your brothers and go see what they're up to, and then I want you to report back to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, and he went to Shechem, and, and once Joseph got to his brothers in, in Shechem. His brothers planned to murder their younger brother. They later settled on instead selling him into slavery. Can I just stop for a moment and tell you that this world loves to crush, to crush your God-given dreams. This world wants nothing more than to take those promises and those, those, those dreams that God has given you. And, and this world wants nothing more than to crush them. This world wants nothing more than to, to snuff out the life of those dreams that God has given you. But even though his family left Joseph, God did not. Genesis chapter 39 and verse 1 now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. He was, uh, he was thrown into a pit. He was uh, sold into slavery, and he, he was taken out of his, his homeland, taken down to Egypt. And uh, down there, Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. But verse 2 says this, The Lord was with Joseph. So even though his family pushed him out. Even though his family left him, God was still with him. And, and not only that, the Bible says that he was a successful man and was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. Verse 4, so Joseph found favor in his sight. And served him, and he made him overseer of his house, and, 
And all that he had, he put under his authority. Do you see how, how even, though, uh, even though it's not working out the way Joseph thought it would, it's not working out according to his dream, God is still doing something. So it was, verse 5 says, from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. God was with Joseph. While in Potiphar's house, Joseph did his best to serve his master. Look, he, he wasn't where he wanted to be. He wasn't where he should be. But God still blessed him, and Joseph didn't hang his head. He still did his best. He, he served his master the best that he could. Amen? So no matter what situation you're in, I don't know if this is, I don't know if I'm in the right job. Well, I, I don't know either, but while you are there, do the best you can. I don't know if I'm, you know, I, boy, I, the, my neighborhood, I'm, I don't know if I should be. Well, while you're there, do the best you can. God will, will, will bless you. God will be with you right where you're at. While in Potiphar's house, disaster strikes again. This time he is accused by Potiphar's wife of sexual misconduct. It's put into prison. Here he is doing the best he can, serving, serving Potiphar the best he can. God is even blessing him, but disaster strikes again. Someone lies about him. Someone accuses him of something he did not do, and he gets put into prison. Genesis 39 and verse 20. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison. Verse 21 says this, but the Lord was with Joseph. Put into prison. He's, he's, he's shackled. He's, he's, he's taken out of the element that he was, he was, he was blessed in. Certainly, God, was, certainly, certainly this is where you still wanted me, right? God, you were even blessing what I was doing, but... Even though he got put into prison, God was with him and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. You see how God is still working. Let me just stop and say that your situation may not be optimal. You may have taken a wrong step. Someone may have, have, have lied about you. Someone may have, have accused you of something you didn't do. You may, you may not be in the, in, the, in the right place. You may not be exactly where God wants you, but God can still be with you. God is still with you. And God can prosper you right where you are at. I'm not talking about sin. I'm not, I'm not talking about backsliding. I'm talking about circumstances that, that you did not foresee, that you did not plan out, and, and just somehow, here I am. I'm in this situation, God. It's not where I wanted to be, but here I am. God is still with you. And God can still prosper you, and God can still bless you, still has a purpose. Verse 23, the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. And one can, I, I cannot help but think, wonder, how in the world did Joseph stay strong in the midst of all of this? Having your family neglect you, having your family turn their back on you, selling you into slavery, talk about murdering you, having, having someone who, look, they, they were almost the, 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 the enemies of the Jews and, 
And he gets put into an Egyptian's house, a, a place that they, they did detestable things. But what did he do? He put his head down and he served. He did, he, he did everything unto the Lord. He tried to do the best he can. And what happened? Someone lies about him. And not only that, the guy he worked so hard to serve that tur turns his back on him and throws him in the prison. How much more can you take, Joseph? Let down after let down, disappointment after disappointment. He goes on to correctly interpret the, uh, the butler's dream. There's, there's, there's a couple other people in prison with him, and, and they share their dream, and, and he's still spiritually sensitive enough to, to discern the Lord's interpretation. Something tells me he is still staying connected to God. He is still praying. He is still calling out because when that situation arises where, where, the, where the butler and the baker said, I have a dream and I, we don't understand it, Joseph is still spiritually sensitive enough and hears the voice of God enough to correctly interpret the dreams. The dreamer begins interpreting other people's dreams. Imagine that. He, he doesn't know what his dreams mean. He would love for someone to interpret his dreams. I had a dream a while ago that, that I was a ruler, but no one interpreted that for me. I found myself thrown into a pit. I found myself thrown into slavery. I found myself put into prison, but he remained faithful enough and sensitive enough to God that when somebody else needed help, he was able to help them. How many of us could have, how many of us could have held on that long? How many of us could have been spiritually, how many of us would have kept praying after being rejected over and over again? So he interprets correctly the butler's dream, only to have the butler forget all about it. Butler gets placed back into the king's house, and Joseph even you just, I can just see it, like, as, as the royal guard is coming to set him free, Joseph's like, don't forget me. Hey, remember when I gave you that promise and I interpreted for you, don't forget me. Genesis chapter 14, 23. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. I blessed you. I helped you. I encouraged you. And, and what did you do? You left me. You went on to greener pastures. You went on. You went on to see your dream fulfilled. You went on to see your promises come to pass. And you forgot me. Disappointment after disappointment. The Bible says that he stayed in prison another two years. Not two days, not two hours, two years. Thinking about all of the times that he had been let down. Pharaoh has a dream that no one can interpret. After two years, the chief butler says, oh, the Bible actually says this, that he says, I remember my faults this day. Oh, yeah, that's right. There's someone who, who helped me. There's, there's someone who helped me when I was in a certain situation, and I forgot him. And I remember my faults this day, the Bible says, and Joseph is called before one of the most powerful men in the world. He gives the interpretation of the dream, and not only that, offers a, a wise suggestion as to how to prepare for what God has spoken to the king. Genesis 41 and 37 says this, So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Verse 39, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and as wise as you. You shall be over my house. And all my people shall be ruled 
according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. So Joseph is no longer in prison, but he is still away from his homeland and away from his family. When out of nowhere, guess who shows up? His brothers. Make their way down to Egypt, Genesis 42 and verse 3. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin for, with his brothers, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. Benjamin was the youngest brother. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And here it is. Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Some say it's 13 years. Some say more. That Joseph's dream was finally realized. How many of us could hold out that long? How many of us could? Do you wonder why God does that? I mean, anybody ever received a, a, a word from the Lord, a, a, just, just a, a promise from God, direction, and, and then crickets? Like, you get excited. You're like, oh, wow, here it is. And, and, and you kind of feel like Joseph, right? You want to tell people. You want to share that. And, and, and some people receive it and some people don't. But, but you're still excited about it. And then nothing. And then worse yet, things seem to start going backwards. Like, God, I thought you said this was going to happen. I thought you said I was going to be healed, and all of a sudden you get sicker. God, I, I thought you said you were going to go to church, and, and somebody leaves. God, you thought, I, I thought you were going to bring... There's something about come to pass in my life, then all of a sudden you, you feel like you're further away from that goal. That's the life of Joseph. That's, look, there's a reason this is, <laughs> this is given to us. There's a reason that there is so much detail in this story. There's two lessons from this story that I want to point out and maybe just camp out around if I could. First point is this. If you stay the path. If you stay the path, God's purpose in your life will be fulfilled. But you got to stay the path. But I don't know about you, but I do not see very often in the, in the word of God and, and I do not see very often in my own life where God gives a timeline. That's on purpose. Church, that is on purpose. There's a reason that, 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 he will, that he will give a promise and then draw back. That, that is walking by faith, right? Well, often we'll use the line that the, the teacher is silent during the test, right? You, you study, you prepare, you do all that stuff, and, and then the test comes. And, 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 you're, and you're wondering, teacher, I, I got a question. And the teacher's like, not now. You're in the middle of a test. You're in the middle of a trial. You're in the middle of a, you're in the middle of a faith-building opportunity. I'm still there. God is still there. But he's often silent. I, I, don't, know, I don't know what Joseph's God experiences were during those 10 12, 13, maybe more years. I, I don't know. I don't know if God appeared in a vision. I don't know if God spoke to him through prophet. Prof, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us, so I'm left, to, I'm left to say that there's a very good chance that God was quiet during those times. But Joseph stayed the path. And if you will stay the path, 
God's purpose is going to be fulfilled. The second point is this. The path to your purpose is rarely, if ever, a straight line. You, you better get used to the journey. You better embrace the journey. Uh, sometimes we are so goal-orientated. We are so focused on, on the destination when God has so much for you in the journey. If Joseph was just focused on the, the realization of the promise, if he was just focused on, on God, when is this going to happen? When am I going to be a ruler? When are my brothers going to bow down to me? He would have given up. He would have lost hope. But he stayed. He stayed the path. He, he kept on the journey. He said, I, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. I remember, and I may have shared this before, but I remember vacuuming right about where you are, Brother Alberto, and praying, and feeling, this, feeling this call to ministry, feeling that God was, was shifting something in my life and, and not knowing what it looked like, not, not knowing where he was calling me, and, and just not knowing the when, but, but just feeling this this. this this, this burden that I, I could not, I tried to sit down, I just couldn't, couldn't set it down. And, and I remember listening to, to preaching while, while, I was, while, while I was vacuuming, and, and I finally just said, God, I don't care how long it takes. God, I don't, I don't care if it, I remember, God, I don't care if it takes 20 years. Set it down. I set down the timeline. That's important. That's important. For us to dictate to God the timing is foolish. It's foolish. Right? God's timing is, is way different. The Bible talks about, you know, a, a day with God is like a thousand years. A th I mean, we can't, we do not understand his timing. So for us to try to pin God down to a certain time. Now, now, now pray. Specifically, there's nothing wrong with that. That goals, sure. But when those things don't happen, when, when you're doing everything that you know to do and, and those things don't happen quite the way that you want to, how are you going to react? Are you going to get frustrated? Are you going to throw up your hands? Are you going to feel like God left you? Are you going to feel like you made a wrong decision? Or are you going to be like Joseph? and just stay the path. Most likely, I would say, looking back, that Joseph wasn't ready to lead. I, I don't believe that when he was going out to his brothers in Shechem, I, I don't believe he was ready for what God had for him. So God had to bring him through a process. That's why you can, that's why you can really miss out if you if you get frustrated in the process. That's why if you get, if you get so tied up into the timing and, and when is this going to happen, you, you, you'll miss out on, on what God is really trying to do because that's where most of the work happens. That's where, 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 where God really moves is in the journey. You don't see it. You don't feel it, but God is doing amazing things. God is working faith and patience and hope into your life if you let them which brings us back to the subject of meekness psalm 25 and verse 9 says the meek will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his way psalm 147 and verse 6 says the lord lifteth up the meek he casteth the wicked down to the ground isaiah 29 and 19 the meek also shall increase their joy. Praise God for that. Increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. I'm talking about meekness. In Matthew 21, Jesus was described as meek as he rode into Jerusalem in, 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 
a triumphal entry. Jesus was described as meek. We know that meekness is a fruit of the Spirit. So how do you gain meekness? And, and what exactly is meekness? First, let me tell you what meekness is not. Meekness is not weakness. All right? We, we sometimes, when we hear the word meek, we think of timid. We think of, oh, you know, that they're, they're, they're just a little bit, you know, they're not very confident. That's not what biblical meekness is. It does not mean weakness. Understand this about meekness. It takes time. Takes time. The best description of meekness that I've come across is this strength under control. Meekness is strength. Get that. Meekness is strength, but it's under control. Again, let's go back to Joseph. He's a dreamer, he's got big ideas, he has big plans. He, 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 has, he, he, he has things that, that he believes God is going to do in his life. But without control. Think of, think of, think of that wild stallion that's, that's running the prairies. Right? Do you have a picture of that? That, that, that beautiful, majestic, free Stallion that's just that's just running, running along the prairie. Beautiful, isn't it? It's also useless. It's useless. It's it's nice to look at, but it's useless. It's like a dreamer, big ideas, but not going anywhere. God desires to take those things. Right? Take, those, take those dreams. Take that power. Take that potential. God doesn't want to waste that. God, God doesn't want you just to get rid of that. I, I feel like that's something that we, we often think that, oh, we, we, we come to the altar and we, we lay our life down and, and we just, everything is, everything is just lost and we just become these monkish Christians that, you know, lock ourselves in a tower and say we're just going to wait for his coming. No, that is not what living for God is about. That is not what the kingdom of God is all about. No, God wants to take those things that you have. God wants to take those dreams. God wants to take those aspirations and those, those big ideas that you have. He wants to use that. I, I firmly believe that that when, when, when there are dreamers in our midst, that I believe that is the way that God created them. And I don't believe we should push them down. I don't believe, we, oh, you should, you're just too proud or you're just, oh, they're a dreamer. Let them dream. God can use that. Here's what God can't use. God, God cannot use weakness. God cannot use somebody who just isn't going to do anything. Well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to wait until God moves me. I'm just going to wait until, well, you'll, be, you'll very likely be waiting for a while. But, but someone who will take what God has given them and allow God to bring it under control. Amen? I'm thankful. For our youth leaders, I'm thankful for the youth staff. I'm thankful for a music department that, that takes these young people and, and, and lets, them, lets them do some things. Lets them get out there and, oh, I don't know if they're quite ready yet. No, I, I tell you, they're not ready yet. But what are the options? We just sit them down and, and tell them you can't do anything until? Or do we let them get out and, and, and begin to... To, to, to try to exercise what God has given them. God can use that. 
God can use somebody who says, Lord, I have a dream. God, there is something I want to do for your kingdom. I don't quite know how it all works out, but God, I want to do something. God can use that. Be ready for the process. The bigger the dream, the the bigger the lessons that you have to go through. Greek war horses. Before they were used in battle, they were what is called meat. They were, they were, they were, they were broken. They were, they were trained to stay in the battle rather than flee at the sound of loud cannons. They were meat. They were broken. They were trained. These are, the, these are the, the tanks of the ancient world, the, the war horses, those, those majestic stallions that were running the prairie. They had to be brought under control. They had to be harnessed until they became useful. You're not going to be useful in the kingdom of God until you're harnessed, until you, bro- until you are brought under his control. Until then... You're running the prairie. You may be pretty to look at. You may think that you're free, but you're useless. What is is useful in God's kingdom is someone who is meat, someone who is broken, someone who is brought under the control of God, someone who is humbled, somebody who has gone through some things like Joseph. I've never broken a horse. I, I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I, I cannot imagine that it is a pleasant thing. I can't imagine that it is just a, a beautiful thing. I'm guessing there's some discipline. I'm guessing there are some things that probably don't feel pleasant to the horse. I'm guessing there are some, everything in the horse wants to go this way when the master says no. I need to bring you this way. I'm guessing there's, there's something in the horse that every fiber of their muscles wants to run and, and break free, but the owner says, stop. That's meekness. That's being broken. That's strength under control. And that church is who is going to inherit the earth. That church is who is going to be used in God's kingdom. It takes time, but it's for a purpose. If the musicians can please come. Again, I, I think back to some of our young people. I think back to the energy. I, I see the energy that some of our children have, and, and, and they, 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 they want to do something. And I, I just, I equate them, I, I, I picture them as, as that horse that is just kind of running free. There's a time. There's a time. Right? There's a, there's a fine line between breaking and wrecking. There's a fine line. There's there's, there's a fine line of going too far and making that horse just useless. There's a fine line between breaking them and, can I say, injuring them. Only God. Only God knows the how, the when, the what. But can I tell you one thing? This I know, it takes time. It takes time. Will you allow yourself to be broken by God? Do you want to do something for the kingdom? Are you excited to, to, to reach out? Are you excited to, 
to teach a Bible study? Are you excited to be used however God would want you to be used? Well, that's awesome. Will you allow God to break you? Will you allow God to give you his timeline? I could be wrong, but very likely it'll be longer than what you anticipated and what you hoped. Are you okay with that? Are you going to stay the course? Are you going to not lose faith? Are you going to stay spiritually sensitive? Are you willing to help someone else with their dream while your dream is still unfulfilled? Can you celebrate with someone when their dream is realized? When in your eyes, oh, how did that come so quickly to them? How, how come they were let out of the prison so quickly when I never even did anything? And two more years he stayed in that prison cell. Can you do that? If so, God will use you. God will use you. I want to remind, I want to remind someone of their dream this morning. Could I stir that up? Could I stir up that dream this morning? Because I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm looking out at maybe some dreamers and maybe some people that, yeah, need that meeking, need that breaking, but I also feel this morning I'm, I'm looking at some people that have been in the prison cell. And maybe you've lost your dream. And maybe you've just said, I guess this is my lot in life. I guess this is, I guess this is my ministry. No. 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 I don't believe your ministry is forever in the jail cell. I believe that God wants to stir up those promises. I believe God wants to revive those promises. I, I'm wondering if somebody can get a little bit of that, a little bit of that fire back in their spirit. I wonder if someone could get a little bit of that, that energy back into their life and say, God, I haven't seen it. I, I left it at the altar 15 years ago, God, but I wonder if someone could stir it up and say, Lord, I know you haven't forgotten and I haven't forgotten either. So God, I'm ready. Lord, I'm willing. Whatever, God, however long it takes and whatever process it takes, God, I'm willing, but I'm not letting go of my dream. I want to stir up somebody's dream this morning. I want to call someone's dream to remembrance this morning. God hasn't forgotten. It's been a while. Uh, and I believe there is something on the other side of this. I believe there is something on the other side of this. Can we stand to our feet? Hallelujah. Man does not know. I do not know. There was no one in, in Joseph's life that could have laid that out for him, that could have told him how much longer he was in the enemy's house he was in Pharaoh's house he was so far away from God's people and in the presence of God and maybe you feel like that maybe you feel like God, I don't even know how you can work in this location I am in the house of Potiphar I am in an Egyptian prison how could I be any further away from where you want me Maybe because Joseph never could have imagined that that promise would have met him in Egypt. That his brothers, that his family would have traveled all those miles into a foreign land to bow down at his feet. 
Bible, no matter your location. God can bring it to pass. I believe God wants to blow someone's mind. I believe God wants to do something only God can do. I believe God wants to do a, a unique work. Something that, Lord, I did not see this coming. If you hold on to your dream. Amen. Wherever you are, wherever that finds you, I wonder if we could take some time and pray. If you need your dream revived, if you need your dream stirred up, if you need to, to come before God and say, God, I haven't forgotten and I know you haven't either. God, stir up that energy. Stir up, God, that excitement. Stir up, God, that desire to, to do that work for you. This altar's open. If you're at a place where you say, God, I, I feel every time I'm moving, I, I feel, God, that you're correcting me, that you're changing me. Well, maybe you are in the making process. Maybe you are in the breaking process. He's not going to leave you. He's just bringing you under his control. There's a purpose for it. Let him do his work.